Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, Steve, I'll, I'll speak to you directly. I think this is a, a thoughtful, thought-provoking, elegantly written paper. I think it's absurd that you're in your first year of law teaching and you produce something this good. Um, so congratulations to you. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Um, this provides, I think, an extremely useful vocabulary for thinking about uh, a lot of problems that you identify. It turns out that um, I've been writing about certain kinds of backdrops for several years now uh, without uh, understanding that uh, and without having you know, theorized sufficiently about them. So uh, I, in particular, am grateful for, uh, for this paper. And you talk about three types of backdrops, uh, the textual incorporations by, by reference, which I think you appropriately say are, um, you know, and they're in, in important to identify here, but uh, you know, less interesting than the other types. And the second one uh, you, you talk about is where text leaves in place pre-existing rules by expressly insulating them against change by other legal actors. Um, you know, your example there is interstate uh, uh, border, in, in interstate border disputes. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say this definitively because uh, I'm sure there's some people here who can prove me wrong, but I'm, I'm trying to think of other examples of that where the text expressly insulates uh, you know, pre-existing uh, atextual rules for, from change. I'm, not, I'm, I'm having a hard time coming up with, a, with some. Uh, my suggestion is maybe only that this might be actually a, a quite small category uh, of backdrops, you know, your category two. Um, category three, um, as you recognize, is I, I think by far the most interesting and, and generative of, of important insights. And this is the, the uh, you know the category where, you know, as you point out, you know the, the language of the Constitution is uh, presumptively defeasible, and that the text can be limited by pre-existing uh, atextual legal rules that come from uh, you know from non-constitutional sources, primarily the common law or the law of nations. Uh, and I have, I have a couple sort of categories of, of points to make about those. One uh, category of points, I think I'm going to just call sort of general housekeeping. Um, this, this might be an inapt description, but what I mean is that you know, this is a work in progress, and it strikes me that there might be places where um, there's ways that you describe this category and ways you describe backdrops that don't always fit with each other, and I think that uh, simply might be because we're, we're dealing with the draft paper, not because there's any problem with the theory. Uh, but secondly, I want to push a bit on sort of the contours of this category of backdrops and suggest that maybe some of the objections to them are uh, perhaps a little stronger than, um, than, what you, uh, w uh, than where you came out. So the first category of, of, of things I wanted to say is um, I, I got sort of an inconsistent message, I think, on exactly how this category of backdrops works, and in, in, in particular on how and whether uh, they're insulated from change by other legal actors. So in a number of places, um, you seem to define uh, a backdrop as something that is, in fact, insulated from change uh, by some part of the constitutional text. Uh, in, in other places, uh, you suggest that a, a backdrop is definitionally something that's insulated from change, but not necessarily by text, but you know, perhaps by you know, unexpressed, unexpressed textual principles or postulates, um, you know, by structure, maybe possibly even by other backdrops themselves, although I'm not sure about that. Um, but then the discussion of the, the defeasibility of the text opens up by saying that this category of backdrops, quote, you know, may or may not be entrenched against new legislation. Uh, but then right after that, um, and, and again in one other place, you suggest that th for this category, this third category of backdrops, uh, they perhaps may only be uh, able to be changed by constitutional amendment. Um, uh, I, I think you know my bottom line is you've identified an incredibly important uh, type of, of issue, you know the backdrop issue. You've raised a lot of interesting questions about it, uh, but there might in fact be a great variety of backdrops. Uh, the answers uh, about whether or how they're insulated from legal change. Uh, li likely vary substantially across the, the different types of backdrops, and it perhaps might just not be possible to say anything uh, that uniformly applies to all of them. Um, that, uh, so, uh, going further on on, on this this third category, um, so you, you know you have a, a, a positive project, and, and I think the positive project could be essentially said to be, you know, sort of how, how is the Constitution drafted, you know, what legal assumptions uh, and background, uh, background assumptions about the nature of legal texts were, uh, were the drafters uh, operating with. And I think on this sort of positive question, it's, it strikes me that you got it right. I mean, I'm, I'm quite convinced that uh, the Constitution was written uh, with a background assumption that the, the general language was defeasible and could be defeated by 
non-constitutional legal rules, in particular the common law and the law of nations. I mean, that's, that strikes me as exactly right. Um, just as an aside, you know, you, you provide some evidence that this, in fact, was uh, specifically understood to be the case, you know, from uh, you know, Madison at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. You know, to the extent that there's other uh, easily deployed evidence to, to show that this, you know, was in fact uh, a, a view held by, um, you, know, you know, by drafters and ratifiers, I think that would be great to put that in. But uh, you know, even without that, um, it strikes me that you must be right that. Um, that this, this was that the Constitution was written with an assumption that its broad language would be defeasible by non-constitutional legal rules, uh, and I think it's, it's incredibly helpful to, to make that point, to foreground that point, and I think you definitely point out uh, the right types of questions that we should be asking about, um, uh, you know, by adopting this category of backdrops. You know, you're asking questions like, you know, what parts, what specific parts of the Constitution's text were, you know understood to be defeasible, you know, which specific rules of non-constitutional law um, did in fact, you know, were in fact understood to limit or defeat those parts of the text, uh, and then which government actors, uh, if any, were empowered to change those backdrop, you know, non-constitutional legal rules, you know, whether it's Congress, or the President, the federal courts, state courts, state legislatures, or perhaps no one um, in, in the case of a backdrop that might be entirely insulated against uh, against legal change. Uh, so I think it's an incredibly successful paper, you know, for giving us this vocabulary and for pointing out the types of uh, of questions that we should be asking. Um, and a, a couple of points where I might you know push back a little bit. Um, the paper seems to reject the idea that uh, common law or law of nations, uh, when functioning as a backdrop, could be changed or updated by the courts. Um, I don't have uh, I don't have a definitive view on whether that's right or not, but I, I think the answer might be that neither did the founding generation. Um, there was uh, a lot of, in, in my understanding, there was a, a lot of sort of confusion and, and contradiction in terms of uh, you know what precise legal status the common law and the law of nations were thought to have vis-a-vis -vis the you know the new constitution that was being adopted. Um, you're definitely right to point out that there was a sort of a heavy uh, sense, and many people had uh, in this pre-positivistic period that this was general law that just existed out there in the world, and that you know the role of courts was to find this law, not to be uh, you know making it or updating it in any sense. But there's also uh, you know many indications that I've seen that you know that members of the founding generation were sort of uh, more positivistic or more uh, you know modern than that, that they actually understood that you know the law of nations and the common law. Uh, both uh, did change over time as a result of intentional policy decisions. Uh, you know, one thing I'm thinking about is um, you know controversies about uh, about prize law and issues about uh, whether free ships make free goods or whether other you know prize laws should be applying. Uh, you know, a lot of prominent members of the founding generation uh, very specifically wanted to update and change the law of nations and understood it not to be uh, you know some body of law that was just out there in the world existing, but something that. Um, you know, but something that did, uh, in, in fact, change as a result of, you know, of government action. Um, and so when the Constitution, you know, uh, extends, you know, the federal judicial power, you know, to cases in admiralty, you know, when Congress implements that in the Judiciary Act, um, I think, you know, a decent num number of members of the founding generation would have thought that that was essentially a delegation to the federal courts uh, to be applying and elaborating and uh, updating uh, as, as uh, situations required. Um, you know this body of non-constitutional law, uh, and, and you know without going into you know all the other areas of common law and, and the law of nations, I, I think it, it might be the case that there's a similar sort of ambiguity and, and mixed views about both the, the status of that type of law and, and what role the federal courts could play uh, in applying it, whether it's merely sort of finding pre-existing law or whether there's more of a generative uh, sense that they were uh, that they're updating and, and, and making law. Um, Two objections that you raise, I, I, I think it's a terrific part of the paper, the third part where you, you, know, you list uh, these very objections and try to respond to them. Uh, on two occasions, I thought the objections might have been a little stronger, perhaps, than, than you allowed. Uh, you have the, you know, the sort of dead hand objection, uh, which is that, you know, is this even sort of deader than the dead hand of the written Constitution, you know, binding us to uh, a textual, you know, non non-constitutional law that was never, you know, specifically voted on and, and adopted by, uh, by anyone. Um, and you, your response, as I understand it, is, well, you know, the founders decided to make some rules binding by putting them explicitly in the text, and the founders decided to make other rules binding by silence. 
uh, and that the second type of, uh, of bindingness is no more deader than the first. Um, I, th you know, I think that response probably, probably could be stronger or needs some more developing, just because in, in discussing uh, you know, why it was most natural to read the Constitution's text as defeasible, uh, you argued, and, and I was persuaded, that um, the drafters of constitutions or texts uh, often don't know about and shouldn't be understood to have taken a firm position on, uh, you know, shouldn't be understood to have reached an agreement about all of the, you know, all of the voluminous uh, background rules that, you know, might be, you know, possibly, uh, you know, defeating the, you know, the plain text. Um, and, and that strikes me as that's pr probably the, the best uh, understanding of what the, the founding generation's uh, relationship to the law of nations and the common law would have been, that uh, you know, some general se sense that it, it might in various ways be defeating other, you know, otherwise broad plain text, but not having reached an agreement about you know, every single place where, where that would be true. Um, and if that's the case, then I think I mean, the actual, there actually is sort of a debtor hand than, um, than in the case of, of explicitly uh, voted on uh, written text. Um, I mean, for me, that's not a dispositive objection against, uh, against understanding the Constitution this way, but I, I think it's maybe you know, a little bit stronger than you said. Um, and, and secondly, on the indeterminacy objection, um, you, know, you said, you know, does, this, uh, does, does recognizing that there are um, you know, unenumerated powers or, or unenumerated rights um, that come from you know, non-textual sources, other sources of law, does this open up a Pandora's box of indeterminacy? Um, your response was that um, you know, your backdrops theory, uh, you said sort of uh, uh, that, you know, the, on the only thing that matters is whether the history is right or whether it's baloney. Uh, you said you know, the backdrop theory gives precisely as much weight to claims of unenumerated rights or powers as they deserve according to you know, what, the historical, uh, what the historical record supports. Uh, it seems to me that this maybe sort of doesn't fully grapple with some of the, the features of the written constitution that are normatively attractive to a lot of people. Um, you know, one feature that you know, the writtenness uh, supplies uh, is a constraint on judges. You know, it's widely thought. I'm not saying if that's right or wrong or good or bad or whatever, but I think that's, you know, it's widely thought that, um, that one thing that a, a very text-based originalism uh, does well is, is constrain judges. And it strikes me that, um, uh, that you know, people who, uh, who've, you know, who find that to be an important value would have a, a serious indeterminacy problem with, um, you know, with your approach. Uh, and then the second you know, feature of writtenness that's normatively attractive to a lot of people is, is you know, the democratic legitimacy that comes from the specific words having been debated and, uh, and voted on and adopted by the people through you know, super majoritarian means. Um, and uh, you know, if you're right, which I think you are, that um, drafters would not have specifically uh, you know, reached agreement about all of the features of the common law or law of nations that were gonna be serving as backdrops, then it strikes me that um, uh, you know, the indeterminacy about that is uh, perhaps uh, you know, normatively problematic for people who place, uh, uh, you know, who find originalism attractive because of the democratic legitimacy that voting on a written text gives. Uh, but as I said, I think this is a, a terrific paper, um, and uh, I, I really do congratulate you for it.